All right, before we get out of here today, we're going to have a fun game. We're going to go rapid fire style. We're going to start with Logan. I'm going to give you, I have six of, uh, I, I, I don't want to call it bad takes. because Sometimes I think hot takes are good takes just for yeah, entertainment's yeah. sake. Let's just call these, let's call these takes that I vehemently <laughs> disagree with. Okay. I've got, I've got six of them. Uh, what I want to do is uh, we're going to go back and forth. We'll go rapid fire style. I just want you guys to give your initial reaction, like what your what your basketball mind screams when you see something like this, when you're scrolling through your phone in the morning over some coffee, like the spit take, and then and then what comes next. All right, so Logan, you're up first. This is from the famous Hooper Twitter account, Ball Don't Stop. The three highest scoring players ever, meaning Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and uh, uh, Carl Malone and LeBron James wouldn't really be considered pure scorers, but their durability was insane and their scoring arsenal just worked so well and efficiently. They really outlasted everyone from their era and the era after their era. Logan, how do you feel about Carl Malone, LeBron James, and uh, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar not being considered pure scorers by the Hooper community? I don't really know what that means. I, I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> How do you score nearly 40,000 points or 40,000 plus points? The only guy I'd say is probably Carl Malone because he was a John Stockton merchant, but that's another conversation for another day. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, dude, like Kareem and LeBron just have two of the most unstoppable scoring skill sets of all time. LeBron with the fact that he's one of the greatest rim pressures and most unstoppable athletes ever. And then Kareem uh, would just one of the most immaculate post games and shots of all time. So I don't really understand – I wouldn't consider them like pure scorers because they do everything else, but to not call them scorers is ridiculous. They're two of the greatest of all time. Uh, that's kind of ridiculous to me. Yeah, totally unsurprising, though, coming from <laughs> Ball Don't Stop especially. And I think that there is a large group of the basketball community who has a serious infatuation with basically – the aesthetics of one-on-one -on -one that boy nice that boy nice that boy nice and very little interest in the effectiveness logan said it well like if you can't stop something you can't stop it what ball don't stop said in that tweet about the effectiveness of it that's what matters what should define if somebody is a great scorer i mean pure score is such a nebulous term like what does pure mean that you also don't excel in the other aspects of the game like is that something that we want to be lauding do we love cam thomas because all he does is take tough shots and like yeah i like watching cam thomas when he's on like you know he's got a really shifty movement style and he's got a deep bag and he's a tough shot creator but there's a reason that there's not a lot of teams banging on the door to get cam thomas there's a reason that jamal crawford wasn't as good as he was fun to watch a highlight tape of like these dudes who may have these awesome dribble combinations and maybe great difficult shot makers like if you aren't getting to your spots if you aren't making life easy on yourself offensively, and especially if you aren't doing the other things that matter in a basketball game, playmaking, defending, rebounding, et cetera, then you're just not going to be that effective in an NBA game. So I see this sort of thinking all the time. To me, it just doesn't make sense. Like there is value in having a tough shot making skill set, right? Like if you are going to try to run clutch offense through Giannis Antetokounmpo, who may be a super effective scorer, you're going to have issues because if teams just fully commit to, hey, we're walling off the rim in this specific situation, he doesn't have the requisite counters. But for most of the game, I mean, he's just going to be able to get 30 efficiently because he has these unstoppable traits. And I think many people overvalue just how does it look when you score? Yeah, I think I, I think it gets a little complicated when you're differentiating between the Giannis types and Agreed. like the the Agreed. Lebrons and the Kareem Abdul Jabbar's and the Jokic's because it's like there is some truth to the fact that you know Giannis's lack of skill polish can become an issue when he gets into the half court, totally. which is more complicated than just reading his point per game. But he's numbers. a better scorer than Jamal. But yeah, Croft, like it really, you know. <laughs> but for sure, yeah, no, you're you're that, that, Ball don't stop you, wouldn't person, say 100 that. Agree. The, uh, <laughs> The uh, but yeah, like I, I the the hilarious part to me about this tweet is the the part that says their scoring arsenal just works so well and efficiently, and it's like oh, so <laughs> that's what a pure scorer is, isn't it? Like like yeah, that's the literal definition. The and then also like again, so much of the aesthetic appeal, like some of these guys, like LeBron, for instance, 
Uh, I think, honestly, LeBron's bag, so to speak, has been highly underrated under over the course of his career. But also, like, bully ball is the most effective and reliable form of scoring when you get to the later form, uh, later rounds of the playoffs. That's just a fact. And lastly, before we move on, like, the funniest thing to me is, like, the, the 16 dribble combination pull-up jump shot is also, like, one of the hardest things to play mm-hmm. alongside as a teammate, like it, it's a rhythm disruptor. And what's so funny is like all these guys, the, the Carl Malone's, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's and LeBron's their scoring came in a way that allowed other people to score well around them. And like, then you get these guys like Kyrie or not uh, Kyrie's more lumped in with just the way that Dallas plays. But let's talk about Luca, for instance, like Luca, like you have to put play finishers around him because if you put other guys who can dribble shoot and pass around him they would never be in rhythm because they'd be watching Luca take Mm -hmm. 17 dribbles on every single possession and so like what's so funny is the specific type of style of scoring that he is referencing here is probably the kind that is like least it, it has a value but it's less valuable than the other forms of scoring that exist out there okay next one This is not a quote, but it's come from several Miami Heat players. So I'm just going to kind of reference it vaguely. We'll start with you, Carson. A few Miami Heat players have said that Chris Bosh was the most important player (laughs) on the Heatles because he was a stretch big, uh, even though he was on the same team with LeBron James. What's your reaction? Yeah, that's pretty hilarious. That's a classic case of people galaxy brain and things and making... uh things more complicated than they are. I don't really have a bunch to say. I mean, LeBron was clearly (laughs) the best player on the planet in both Miami title years and uh, just an absolute fulcrum, both offensively and defensively. His versatility in Miami was the best of his career. His ability to play multiple styles. Like I think the super heliocentric ball dominant LeBron that we got in the second Cleveland stint, like his mastery of the game intellectually was incredibly impressive but his ability to play off ball as well in Miami with just that sort of freak athleticism. I mean, the best combination of his explosiveness from those first Cleveland years and his strength. And then he was at his defensive peak. I mean, LeBron was (laughs) at one of the highest peaks we've ever seen from a basketball player ever. And so I'm very happy that Chris Bosh was able to stretch the floor. And obviously he was a very good basketball player, but you take LeBron off those teams, uh, you see what happens like in the subsequent years. And obviously D Wade had diminished at that point. And Chris Bosh obviously had all of his health issues, but like they were an okay playoff team after LeBron left. And uh, I think it's very obvious that they would not have been contending. And it's like giving Iggy the finals MVP in 2015. Sometimes we look at people maybe exceeding their value or doing one specific thing that is super valuable. Oh my God, he guarded LeBron and he shot the ball really well. And we want to reward that. But it's like, who would you not be with in the, who would you not be there in the first place if you didn't have, well, maybe it's Steph Curry, the guy who completely changed modern NBA offense and drove all the Warriors success on that side of the ball. So I think that's a very silly take. I mean, credit to Chris Bosh for grabbing one of the most important rebounds in NBA history, but, uh, yeah, I just completely disagree with this one. I'll give I'll give Chris Bosh credit for doing another thing too. I think it's important too when you have that accumulation of talent, when you have two bona fide guys who are maybe the best players on the planet. Um, it, it takes sacrifice. You know what I mean? Chris Bosh had to sacrifice his role, his numbers, his uh, view of you know his stance as a player in the league, legacy wise, to go win championships. That's what championships take sacrifice from guys you know taking a lesser role and doing that role to perfection and I'll give Chris Bosh a ton of credit for doing that and being a a really underrated player I think he's probably underrated now especially you know combined with the fact that he took a lesser role and the fact that you know his career was shortened because of blood clot issues uh, that's got to be one of the most hyperbolic takes or ridiculous like what, what are we doing here man? I mean that, that version of LeBron's one of the greatest players ever yeah, I for the record, love Chris Bosch, a guy that I think was mm-hmm. underrated in a lot of ways because he wasn't the same kind of like scoring force that he was in Toronto. But like his willingness to embrace a role specifically as essentially a defensive minded stretch big for Miami was massively important to that team reaching its ceiling. Uh, basically, as long as he wasn't going against Tim Duncan, he was a very, very good defensive player. 
Uh, and towards the end in 2013 and 2014, his ability to knock down the three point shot in particular was, was, was massively important. That said, uh, LeBron James, if you literally just went up to him in that time and was like, Hey, uh, just do all the stuff Chris Bosch does for it. He would do better than Chris Bosch does mm-hmm. at that stuff. He was a better shooter. He's better rim protector. He's better. Like, like literally LeBron James was better at being Chris Bosch than Chris <laughs> Bosch was at being Chris Bosch. That's how freaking good LeBron was in that time frame. So like, it's just completely ridiculous for the record. I'm a big believer in like, like roster holes and value. Like it's kind of like we talked about with Jared Vanderbilt mm-hmm. earlier because Chris Bosch was like the one big they had that was skilled enough offensively to space the floor. He certainly was valuable, more valuable necessary. Like I would say he's more valuable than you would think given his skill set because of what that team mm-hmm. needed. But again, that's not galaxy branded. It's LeBron James. All right, Logan, you're up next. Lance Stevenson. Quote, my favorite player right now is Anthony Edwards. He reminds me of me with the super green <laughs> oh light. <my> God. <laughs> what is <laughs> what is your response when you hear that quote? <laughs> That could only come from Lance Stevenson. Wow. Um, who does Lance Stevenson think he was? I, what Anthony Lance- Edwards without a super green light, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I don't really have anything for that one, man. I don't. What did Lance Stevenson ever do? Yeah. He had a couple good. That's the point. He had a couple good playoff runs, man. I like Lance too, dude. He was a good. When I was a kid, dude, those Pacers teams were some of my. I loved watching that team grow up. I hated the Heat so much as a kid, man. Watching those Pacers teams, Danny Granger, Roy Hibbert, Paul George, David West, those were awesome teams to watch, man. And I died a little inside watching them get just crushed uh, in the Eastern Conference Finals, those heartbreaking final games. Um, And Lance Stevenson was a cool deterrent, you know, blowing in the ear, pissing off LeBron a little bit. I liked Lance a lot, man. Um, zero zero comp there's there's zero <laughs> there's zero comp for that man that's uh wow dude lance is in the g league right now like lance what are you talking about man is that what he's doing he's, he's the playing g the g league, league right now. what are you talking about grinder so there's still hope he just needs that green <laughs> this light this is a good take <laughs> this is a good take from lance and we must not forget that in the 2014 season he had five triple doubles back when that really meant something before the triple double had been yes. devalued by these <laughs> mo- modern stat padding big guards. I love this from Lance, dude. It seems like everybody wants to be Ant these days. Ant definitely has an aesthetic that I think captivates a lot of people. Personality, play styles, athleticism, obviously. And you know what, Lance? If that's what you want to believe, man, then you go right ahead and believe it. I'm a huge Lance Stevenson fan. Uh, obviously he had his limitations as a player, but he was just fun and he was good for the league and like his battles with LeBron were fun. He even had like that fun phase with, uh, with LeBron, with the Lakers in that 2019 season where, you know, like obviously he wasn't uh, a super high level contributor for them consistently, but he had his moments there where like hit some big shots and, you know, danced for the crowd (laughs) and that sort of thing. To me, it's just a classic case of like Lance is a Supreme confidence guy. And so I'd be surprised if he didn't feel this way about himself. It's the identity that carried him to the NBA. And so I actually respect (laughs) it. Uh, Next one. This is, this one is for you, Carson, to start from our colleague, Gilbert Arenas, who obviously we love Gilbert Arenas. Gilbert Arenas uh, was a foundational part of my basketball experience growing up as a LeBron fan. Those of you guys who remember LeBron with the Cavs, it was those battle with the battles with the wizards early on. I also think he's one of the most talented people in the sports media space. That said, had a take that I don't necessarily agree with. I shouldn't say I don't necessarily agree with. I vehemently <laughs> disagree with. For, for, there's two phases to this one. The first quote, the NBA took away aggression to open up the Euro League. When they first started getting here, it was too rough for them and they didn't make it. So eventually they softened the rules to open up international. And then later on, I know what they can do, Arena said. Get rid of all the Europeans. Some of his colleagues burst into laughter at the absurd idea, but Arenas appeared to be completely serious. You go to college to learn defense, Arenas continued. What college did Europeans go to? They don't deserve to, they don't go to college whatsoever. They have no athleticism. They have no speed, no jumping ability. They are a liability on defense. There's 150 euros in the league today. Name the top 10 defenders. None, just Rudy Gobert and Giannis Antetokounmpo. Other than that, they're just offensive players. They're not defensive players. What was your feeling on that position taken by Gilbert Arenas? Yeah, this is a real for the books level bad take really bordering on some genuine xenophobia. Like that's some pretty wild stuff at the end there. And it's just totally 
unjustified. Like, I don't understand the notion that they, quote, took the physicality out of the NBA for these European players. When if you look at the best European players right now, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Luka Doncic, Nikola Jokic, are those not three of the most brute force physical players in the NBA, period? And by the way, like... The Euro League is a more physical league. They allow more physicality defensively. So I think there was this long held reputation of European players as being soft in the NBA that I just don't think is substantiated. And obviously the point about a lack of athletes is not true. The point about a lack of defenders is not true. And we are continually seeing more and more great European talents who don't look the same. Like, obviously, Luka and Jokic are not in the traditional mold of, like, a great NBA athlete. I think it's cool to watch guys who find ways to succeed in spite of that, and they have their all-time special traits. But, like, we have dudes coming up in this draft. Risa Shea, Sar, like, these dudes may be the top two picks in the draft. Nikola Topic, all of these guys, Europeans from over the continent with different play styles, I just think uh, Gil missed on this one big time. Europeans are dominating the NBA right now and are going to continue to do so for good reason. And it's because they're really, really, really good at basketball. Yeah, I, I have immense respect for Gilbert Arenas. He was my favorite player growing up. I have a Gilbert Arenas jersey hanging up in my room right now. Uh, I love Gil, man. Uh, my guy, uh, Washington. You know, I mean, when I was a kid watching ball, he was – kind of the star on the East coast. He was all the DC had. Uh, I love Gil. I also, I just fundamentally disagree with the Euro league part, especially about the, the physicality and also the readiness that these guys come into the league to you're playing against grown men from day one that are physical, that also know how to play the game. Like they play a unselfish, beautiful brand of basketball. Um, and the physical part, I think the physical part has a lot more to do with the referees than anything than you pointing to like a, a, a certain group of people that play in the league. Now I don't understand that one at all. And this is a tangent guys. I know it's off, but also uh, man, dude, refs really don't know what they're watching, man. Did you guys see the Kansas? Uh, yes. The, oh my gosh. Dude. The block that's, at the end. Yeah. I mean, how do you play? I've played, I just play pickup basketball, man, but it's like, dude, like these refs, I think this should, we need to do one of two things with the refs. They either need to mandatorily play like an off season of basketball where they play like pickup games against other refs. <laughs> so we can give them real basketball experience. I love this or idea. We need to find them. Uh, and we need to take money. Hold out on, of hold on, for hold on, bad hold on, hold on. That was a real heat of the moment. Very quick bang bang play that he I missed. Don't that know, wasn't a dude. misunderstanding of basketball rules. I agree. Like that was there, an odd basketball moment you don't normally see a, a clean block at the rim like that and then right just the way that his momentum is the way that he fell it was unclear in the moment they should just have a review system that they can well, and that was, in college and that was also my yeah. yeah your your point about the actual officiating in the big picture i agree with but i agree with carson in the sense that like that's a that's a call that like if it, it's not a surprise yeah in the moment you think he hit him from behind that's what happens most of the time he's trailing the play it's a really hard play mm -hmm. he made it I don't know yeah. the ref on the the ref on the left hash seemed like he had a really good vantage point of the ball. <laughs> Logan and... is really pissed about the Sanford chance. He's going down yeah, with the ship on this one. Just, <laughs> as a, as a basketball fan, as a guy who enjoys playing basketball, that just ha it, it just makes your heart sink, man. When a guy makes such a into to take that moment away from that kid uh it just hurt me as as a fan i you know what i mean you live for moments like those as, as a player and as a, a chase down block in an ncaa <laughs> tournament game that what does this have to do with end, europeans in the it NBA? Doesn't. <laughs> refs suck refs refs blow games refs need to play basketball and uh learn how the game works i was disappointed i think the physicality aspect is a is a ref issue and not a european issue man that's also ridiculous to me so I am going to go I'm because you guys have hit most of the notes on this arenas thing. I'm just going to hit you guys with my take on why foreign basketball players are taking over the NBA. I think it's an indictment of our basketball development at all levels. I think uh, starting from I've seen it personally uh, with AAU coaches and just in general, as we work up through the system, 
I think that we are doing a poor job of training basketball players at all levels. I think that there's way too much of a focus on on ball development as it pertains to like uh, dribble combinations and footwork, which by the way, I think is a monumentally important part of player development. It's something that I specifically do for, uh, for my basketball team that I coach that said that is all that is, is a tool to use during the flow of basketball games, but the flow of basketball games has so much more to do with learning how to play the game. And I don't think that we do a good enough job of that specifically. Mm -hmm. And I talk a lot about low hanging fruit in the NBA. And what, what I mean by that is like, I look at high level skill development as a, as a margin improver, as a ceiling Mm -hmm. raiser. I look at the low hanging fruit, as the actual meat and potatoes of basketball games. And I think that's why I'm such a huge fan of Denver. I think Denver is one of the all-time great low-hanging fruit mm-hmm. teams. Uh, they 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 will make tough shots, but they're going to get all the easy ones that they can find in a game. And I think in general, I think honestly, like it, uh, uh, Gilbert had a reference to college. Honestly, I think, I think overseas guys are getting exposed to professional basketball earlier, and that helps mm-hmm. a lot. And they're playing with grown men earlier, and they're learning – higher level basketball concepts earlier. And I think in general, like I, there's hope. Anthony Edwards is a major hope. Uh, obviously Jason Tatum's development is is something to keep an eye on, but like we're in a situation now where like the best players that are coming out of America are just not as good as the best players that are coming out from the rest of the world. And I, I, I think if this trend continues and if, and if here in America, we can't, kind of like revamp some of our basketball development. I think we could be in a situation in 15, 20 years where team USA is no longer the, uh, the, the favorite to win when we go into these overseas comp, uh, comp- competitions. As of right now, I still think the U S has a big edge just, um, because of when everyone is healthy and they mm-hmm. actually all go play. I think we'll learn that this summer. I think, I think the LeBron AD Tatum, you know, KD Steph group is going to run rough shot over the rest of the world. But a lot of those guys are older and the day and age of, of getting consistent, you know, top five type of prospects coming out of, uh, of America is, is, is fading. And I just, you know, honestly, like, I just, I just hope we can figure it out sooner than later. Cause I do think that there's some truth to Gilbert Arenas talking about the quality of, of, uh, the athletic gifts that we produce here from our American basketball players. We, we produce some incredible prospects, but we're just not developing them well enough. And, and I hope that we can, Uh, figure that out over the years. All right, two more, and then we're out of here, starting with you, Logan. This is from Nate Jones, an NBA agent. I actually think League Pass is a net negative for the NBA. Too much access to games has made games carry less weight slash meaning. I think if you're going to have League Pass, it should be very expensive, except for maybe one or two days a week. What's your take? Yeah, dude, let's charge all the NBA fans way more money to watch a basketball game. Dude, I hate that. I hate that the NBA has fans, man. I hate that people watch the product. If you're going to have an issue with games carrying weight, why is it not a games played and scheduling argument instead of a viewership argument? I mean, for me, it's like, baseball i can't watch baseball man it's 162 games i don't have time to keep up with what everybody's doing and who's hot here and you know what the reality of baseball is the only thing that matters is the final two months of the season when somebody's hot so it's like you know what i mean i understand i have an issue with maybe oh they played too many games or you know guys are tired and guys can't stay healthy i understand that argument wholeheartedly Yeah, man, let's charge the everyday NBA fan. Uh, Let's pinch all their pennies out of their pocket and make them pay an exorbitant (laughs) amount of money to watch a basketball game. Um, The real fans are going to watch. The fake fans aren't. It's really as simple as that. That's got to be one of the stupidest takes I've ever heard, man. First of all, I just want to say I love this game. This is a lot of fun. But this is probably the single worst take I've seen this year. Just because it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, Logan hit on it. If you think that regular season games are devalued, which I think a lot of people think, shorten the regular season. If it's 72 games, if it's all the way to 58 games. The problem, of course, is that that's not financially viable for the league. So perhaps Nate Jones really, really likes the NBA, like the league itself, not the consumer, and really wants the NBA to profit the most because, like, that's the only logical explanation behind this take. Otherwise, I don't see why the burden would be on the people for something that is related to the product, the volume of the product. And I just love watching regular season basketball, so I'm not going to complain about the regular season 
being too long, even if 82 games, I do think is a bit excessive at this point. And obviously the NFL has an advantage because it's a 17 game season. Every single game, the stakes, the, uh, weight of it is so significant and they do such a great job of packaging it where you can sit down one day watch it all day and then you're totally in tune with what's going on in the league that's great that's why the nfl is king i think it's a big reason but the nba can't replicate that you couldn't with a 17 game sample size have like an appropriate regular season in the nba obviously and so you operate within the reality which is it's a longer season there's some lulls but it's a lot of fun you get to watch a lot of good basketball and hopefully, unless Nate Jones is put in charge, you don't have to pay $1,000 on a Tuesday night to watch Mavs Pels. I'd rather not, personally. <laughs> he's like Rob Lowe wearing the NFL Shield hat. Yeah, like, he's, he's the anti-Robin Hood. Stan of the league. He's a league stand. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just think it's funny that like it's like, you know what? We have this issue. Not enough people are watching the NBA. Um, so you know what we should do is make it so that they can't watch the NBA like that, that like I, and I'm, I'm a big believer in shortening the NBA regular season, but yeah, that, that was a tough one for me. All right. Last one, before we get out of here, coming to you, Logan, this is from, and, uh, from a LeBron stand on Twitter, your opinion on LeBron as a player and a person should be the number one question on every job interview or first date, because to really believe that your hatred or even deep dislike for him is justified is a telltale sign of who you are and how you perceive the world. Carson, I know that you are happily in a relationship mm -hmm. right now, but let's pretend that you're single and you're out there dating. Um, would you, let's just flip it around for you. Uh, if if this person that you sit down for a date with does not think that Jokic is the best offensive player of this generation, Get do you immediately walk away from the table? Get him out of there. <laughs> no, I think this speaks to a very <laughs> deep emerging issue which we were talking about before we started recording, which is that NBA stand culture is just completely out of control. And I think people make their entire identities about these basketball players who ultimately have no idea they exist. And like, I love basketball, dude, and I am passionate about basketball and I'm passionate about my opinions about a bunch of careers of these different guys. But I think it's much healthier to make it about the basketball players and not to pretend you have an intimate knowledge of LeBron as a person because you don't. You know how LeBron presents himself to the public. And I do think he presents himself positively. And I do think people who like think that LeBron is vile and hate LeBron, maybe that does speak to something a little bit wacky with them or maybe something wrong with them. But I also think if you believe that you know exactly how who LeBron is and you dedicate your life to loving LeBron, you probably want to look yourself in the mirror as well. And I would not lead job interviews. I would not lead dates. I would not lead anything with <laughs> how do you feel about LeBron James? If you answer this incorrectly, I think you are a bad person. I mean, Rick Carlisle's go-to first question on a date was, can you guard out of the pick and roll? And, you know, I yeah. mean, he's, he's got a great point. Um, <laughs> it's true. You know, I think it matters for this guy because I think we finally found the dude with the LeBron bed sheets. So if she <laughs> says no immediately, it's like, well, dang, man, we can't even go back now. It's over. I can't even show her my room. Um, yeah, man. Uh, I think that's how we should start all conversations. I think you pick your niche basketball player that you really like. You gauge their opinion. It's like, uh, hey, girl, you really like Dante Exum? Well, you know, what do you think about Dante Exum <laughs> as a role player for the Mavs? And then – uh you should base everything off that. Do people really love LeBron, man? That's kind of creepy. That's kind of weird, man. It's a well, Carson hit it. It's a it's a it's a uh it's a trend for all of the players. Mm -hmm. Like whether it's Steph, there's uh there's more of them for certain players than others. Jokic is building a significant stand base. Giannis has a pretty sizable stand base as well. Um, uh, but yeah, like, it's crazy. I just imagine, like, I just imagine because it's crazy. Cause there's these people, they literally wake up every morning and then they just, they just fight the fight. They fight the good fight yeah. from, <laughs> from nine to five every single day. I just, I just imagine like Gerald Broflowski in, uh, in South park when he's being an internet troll, <laughs> just like kind of cracking his knuckles. And he's like, all right, here we go. Legacy time, <laughs> you know? Uh, but like specifically, yeah, it, it's funny because like, I I'm, you know, LeBron is the person that got me to fall in love with the game of basketball. He's my favorite player of all time. God knows that I uh, uh, view him with great regard in terms of my list all time, too. I have him just a hair behind MJ. But, like, LeBron fans hate me 
because they they think I give them an unfair shake. And that really should tell you yeah. all you need to know about about how that kind of culture has gone. And I 100% agree with you. I think it's bad for the discourse of the game. I think we all get dumber because of it. I think uh, in general, it's bizarre and weird. Totally. Um, I think being a fan of a player is, is totally normal, but like taking it to that point, I think is, is, is something that I think is bizarre, but at the same time, I think it's here to stay because it's only been getting worse and worse over the years. And, and it's just a big part of, uh, of the way the game is discussed these days and just get ready. Cause Wemby's going to have a oh, huge yeah. stand base and Luca, like Luca has a big, a big stand base as well. It's just a, you know, and it's funny when you talk to these people, like they're, they all think that, that their guy's the best in the world. Like every Luca fan, for instance, is just thoroughly convinced that he's better than Jokic and that, you know, every Giannis fan right now thinks that he's being completely disregarded yeah. and that, and that, that's what it becomes. And it almost takes on like a political type of vibe totally. where, where it's like, you, you, you better take the company line. Otherwise screw you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's where it gets, it gets super bizarre.